Welcome to Bibliophene.com's Interview with the Author series. In these videos, we interview some of the top authors in their field and explore their works and ideas in greater depth. Recently, Bibliophene had the opportunity to sit down with David Quammen, a National Geographic contributor and one of the most acclaimed biological science journalists in America today. David's book, Spillover, originally published in 2012, has regained prominence in the wake of the ongoing worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. In the book, David introduced readers to the concept of zoonosis, or spillover as it's more commonly known, which is the transmission of a virus from an animal carrier into humans. David's book included many examples of spillover events and ended with a warning about the threat posed by coronaviruses found in bats, particularly in China. I started off by asking David about Bozeman, Montana, where he has made his home for more than 30 years. David, my, uh, my geography of the, uh, the American Midwest and the Rockies isn't so good. So yesterday I, I looked at uh, Bozeman on, uh, on Google Maps and I saw that you're, you're actually kind of at the, at the gateway to, to Yellowstone. Absolutely, that's right. We are a gateway community to, well, we're not, we're not literally the gateway communities are the towns that are at, at one of the gates. But yes, people, a lot of people come through Bozeman Airport on their way to Yellowstone or, or driving, they come through Bozeman when they're making a trip to Yellowstone. And it's about an hour and a half for us. So we, we love the park and we get down there, um, usually out of season, um, usually between Labor Day and Memorial Day, as opposed to the other way around, which is when the big tourist season is. Yellowstone is a magnificent place in the middle of winter when it's really cold and really snowy. It's a fabulous place. You've, uh, you've lived in Montana now for, for most of your life, uh, but, you, but originally you were born in Cincinnati. That's correct, yeah, yeah. Born in Cincinnati, went east to Yale for undergraduate, went to Oxford for two years for graduate, and then in 73 came to Montana and I've been here ever since. What's that or what is it about the place you think that, that has uh, made you stay? Um, I, I've said in other places, it was the fact that it's cold, lonely and vulgar. Um, <laughs> were the initial attractions to me. Uh, it's not vulgar anymore. Actually, it's not lonely anymore either. And it's getting less cold all the time. So those three those three rugged characteristics that made it appeal to me back in 1973 um, are, are waning a little bit, but I still love the place. I love the mountains. Um, I love the rivers. Uh, and I love uh, the, the paucity of people. I love the people that my block, I've lived on the same neighborhood block for 35 years. And some of the neighbors have lived here that long or almost that long. So, um, I live in a house with my wife and we have um, just on a lot. We don't have a ranch. We're not, you know, we're not cowboy literary types or anything. Uh, little house with what, what is very much like an English back garden is our backyard. A fence around it, a small place with a lot of greenery and a lot of planting and a lot of tranquility. And uh, then we, we go to the mountains, go to the river when we want to recreate rather than living out there and then going to town to get groceries and to be restless and to see the bright lights and things. So um, it's, it's a, it, it agrees with me. You mentioned Yellowstone looking fantastic in, in the wintertime with the deep snow. I saw, I saw that one of your previous novels um, from 1980, Walking Out, uh, was recently made into a movie and, and that they filmed it near to you in, in Montana. That's right, yeah. It's actually a short story. It's a long short story, which is published in a collection of three stories called Bloodline, Stories of Fathers and Sons. So this story, I wrote it, oh, I wrote it in 1975, I think. So that's 45 years ago. Uh, I, was, um, I was probably a starving bartender at the time in Montana. I had published one book one novel and I was trying to get back into print. And I wrote this story as part of another large ambitious novel that, that was a, partly a novel about the storytelling impulse. So it had stories within 
the larger story. And this was one of those stories. And eventually um, that, that whole novel was never published, but I took three of the stories that were embedded in it and I published them as this book, Stories of Fathers and Sons, including that one, Walking Out. And yes, some wonderful fellows, Andrew and Alex Smith, independent filmmakers, um, produced and directed and wrote, you know, they, they wrote the script from my story. Um, this this uh, movie from my story, which is about survival in the snow. It's a father and son story about a hunting accident and about um, a boy with very little confidence rising to the occasion to do some amazing things. Kind of connected to, to that topic of, uh, of wilderness uh, survival in the great outdoors. I, I saw that when, when you were doing your graduate studies at Oxford that you, you spent some time concentrating on, uh, on William Faulkner. Absolutely, yes. I did my, I became obsessed with Faulkner as an undergraduate when I was a sophomore or a junior. I, I spent a lot of time, whenever I could, arranging my program as an undergraduate to study Faulkner. And then when I went to Oxford, I started off on, in a history program and I spent one term um, doing tutorials and working very hard, essentially on British medieval history, which was very good for me, but was what, not what I wanted at the time. I wanted to go back to studying Faulkner and I wanted to write novels myself. So I shifted my program. I did what in those days was called a B-Lit degree. Now it, they call it an M-Lit. It's sort of like a master's degree in in the U.S., not a not a doctorate. I don't have a I don't have a Ph.D., um, but I did it on Faulkner and particularly structure in Faulkner's most ambitiously experimental novels. I was very interested in structure, which um, is a very important thing with Faulkner. And I think now that that study of f structure in Faulkner's novels probably serves me well when I write a long, complicated nonfiction book like Spillover or like The Tangled Tree. Um, I, I care a lot about structure, but I, I want structure to be not obvious, not orderly, but organic and with, with a sense of surprise, but then a sense of inevitability. It's like oxymoronic sort of thing. Uh, and and I, I thank William Faulkner for my whatever, you know, whatever competence I may have in that way. Um. It's, it's 20 years now, uh, David, since you uh, started your uh, association with National Geographic magazine and um, you, you accompanied Michael Fay on his epic uh, trek through, <laughs> through, through the African river basins, particularly the Congo. Um, what memories do you have of the ex expedition and uh, how has it influenced your writing in the years since? Yes, well, I have vivid memories, and it is the 20 year point um, since I got a call from National Geographic saying, Would you be interested in going on a maniacal um, cross Congo um, hiking expedition with a, a demented but devoted conservationist biologist named Michael Fay? And um, at first I said no, but then I said yes, and that was the beginning of my association with National Geographic. And I made parts of this hike with him. He walked across the last remaining great forest blocks in Central Africa. He had already worked in Central Africa for 20 years as a conservationist for the Wildlife Conservation Society mainly. And he knew how to walk in jungle. He was somebody who didn't need trails, didn't need dry land, didn't wear boots and long pants. He went out in a pair of shorts and river sandals and would just walk a compass line through swamps, across rivers, whatever, to see what was there. And so this, for this grand expedition, which he called the mega transect, transect being a biological survey line, this one being the mega of all the possible biological survey lines, he walked more than 2000 miles on a zigzag path that he had charted in order to stay in the deepest forest and as far as possible away from human impact to see what was left there. How many forest elephants, how many lowland gorillas, how many chimpanzees, including bands of chimpanzees that have never seen humans before. And so we walked and we walked and we walked. He walked for 456 days 
or he was on the trail. At some points he had to pause because there was illness in his crew or he was sick with malaria, but he never came, he never came in from the rain. He never, he never left the forest. When he had to pause, he stayed there 456 days, 2000 miles walking from Northeastern Republic of Congo to the Atlantic Ocean. I walked with him for a total of about 53 days divided into um, four sections. So I would come in, I might come in on a, on a supply boat and we would meet him at a river junction and, and his supply person would give him boxes and boxes of food for his crew and for himself, bring in news and maybe I would come in and then I'd walk with him for 10 days through a forest block and, or two weeks and then there would be another resupply point and I would exit and I would go home and write, write the story for National Geographic and, and let my, my feet heal because my feet would be torn to shreds. I was also walking in river sandals and shorts uh, because it was the most efficient way, but you had to deal with lots of small cuts and scratches and blisters and bruises. And I did that mostly using iodine and duct tape. That was my secret. Iodine and duct tape on my feet. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I have a lot of vivid memories. I have vivid, the memories of forest elephants charging through our campfire as we ate dinner one night, uh, of the wonderful, huge gaboon vipers that we almost stepped on as we bushwhacked through the forest, of the time near the end when we had to swim across what I called the Black Lake, pushing our packs, inflating our packs with air enough to keep them floated and pushing them in front of us as we swam across this Black Lake through these mangroves very near the end. Uh, and a number of other uh, vivid memories, including the stretch of days when we walked through Ebola territory, Ebola habitat. We knew that Ebola virus was there in the forest with us somewhere uh, because it had struck a village nearby uh, at the edge of this forest block. We knew it was living in some animal, a reservoir host. We didn't know which animal. We were careful about um, making sure that the, the crew, the Congolese or Gabonese crew, didn't pick up any dead animals and put them into the, the stew pot at the end of the night from which we all ate. Um, Mike Fay was very careful that they were, we were not eating wildlife. We were not, eat, we're not living off the land, not eating bush meat. Um, we were eating what we could carry, dried fish, um, manioc powder, some rice, sardines. Uh, and I still remember that, that 10 days of walking through Ebola habitat because I knew that Ebola's, the Ebola virus kills gorillas and chimps as well as humans. And we walked for 10 days through magnificent gorilla habitat and we saw zero sign of gorilla, zero gorilla dung, zero gorilla tracks. This block of forest had been emptied out of gorillas, probably by Ebola virus. Um, so there's lots of vivid memories from, from that, the mega transect. And I'm still in touch with Mike Fay. He's a he's he's a he's a madman. He's a wonderful madman, and he's the most serious, devoted conservationist in the world. Was a, was the the mega transect expedition your your first contact with the concept of zoonosis as well? Uh, I think it was, David. I think it was. Uh, I had been interested. In Ebola before that. I had read a bit about Ebola, some of the, you know, some of the popular books um, about this terrifying disease. I hadn't read much of the science, but when I knew I was going to walk through this forest block that was, was Ebola habitat, I started reading up on the science. I learned about a reservoir host in which the virus must live. It has to live somewhere when it's not killing humans. I learned about spillover from that reservoir host into humans. I learned that when a when an animal virus spills over into humans, that's called a zoonosis. It creates a zoonotic disease. So it was that trip through Ebola territory that made me come out of there and say, uh, I think I wanna write a book about this. I think I wanna write a book about the ecology and evolutionary biology of terrifying viruses. I, uh, I was listening to uh, one of your talks available on YouTube yesterday, David, and um, at one point I heard you refer to these, these sorts of viruses, um, zoonotic viruses that achieve um, the transition to uh, humans. 
as having achieved great evolutionary success. Okay, I thought that so was a, I, I thought that was a very interesting way of, of describing it. Could you could, could you tell us more behind? Well, yes, well, yes, and some people don't think about this. I didn't well at the beginning either. But viruses, whether you consider them alive or not, they are entities that have genomes. They replicate their genomes and replicate themselves. They extend themselves in abundance and geographically when they spread through. Um, a population of hosts, and by doing that, they also extend themselves in time. Now, that those are the Darwinian imperatives for any living creature. Extend yourself in number, in geographical space, and in time. That's how uh, a species is driven to survive. And there is variation as viruses um, replicate themselves. They mutate, they make mistakes in copying their genomes. So in a population of viruses, there is genetic variation. There is competition for resources, which virus, which lineage of viruses in a given host gets to steal, the, you know, the most cell, commandeer the most cells of that host to replicate itself. So you get variation in a population, competition, and that leads to the survival of the fittest, natural selection, Darwinian evolution, adaptation. That's the evolutionary biology of viruses. Um, and so um, when is a virus successful? Well, it's successful when it replicates itself abundantly, spreads from one individual to another, transmits through a population, and thereby extends itself geographically in space and also persists in time. And by that measure, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is becoming, I, I would say, one of the most successful viruses in the world. HIV-1, group M, is a very successful virus. It is spread around the world. It has infected, I think, something like 75 million people. It has killed 33 million people or so. Um, and there are other very successful viruses that, that humans carry, some of which don't cause much disease. But, but that's the way I think to, to think about viruses in terms of the, the evolutionary imperatives upon them and, um, and how it affects us. When a virus, for instance, moves from a species of monkey that might be endangered in a part of the Congo forest and it moves from, from that natural host and infects humans and replicates and then evolves enough to transmit from one human to another, that that virus has essentially made the leap from a sinking lifeboat onto a, a, a cruise vessel, a giant cruise vessel. Another way of saying it is that it, it, is, it has won the lottery in evolutionary terms, it has achieved great success. It has rescued itself from oblivion by leaving a host that's be declining and getting into a host that's extremely abundant, us, 7.8 billion of us. So that's viral success. David, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the immense uh, population of humans on the planet now, 7.8 billion. Um, in, in Spillover, um, I, I noted that at one point you wrote, no large bodied animal has ever been nearly so abundant as humans are now. Mm -hmm. um, what consequences does this fact, the abundance of human beings have for um, spillover events? Well, it is the, it is the ultimate cause. The, it, there are 7.8 billion of us. We are not only abundant and large bodied, we are hungry and we are smart. And that means we are very efficient consumers of all of the, the resources and the biological diversity that exists in the rest of the natural world. I don't say in the natural world because we are part of the natural world. There is only one world. Um, but we put huge demands on the rest of the natural world. Um, all the choices that we make, the things that we eat, the things that we wear, the consumer electronics that we buy, um, the fossil fuels that we burn, how much we travel, how many children we have, if we have children. All of those choices determine the size 
of each individual's footprint on the natural world, not just a carbon footprint, but an entire resource footprint. Carbon footprint is certainly part of it. Um, and when you aggregate those individual footprints, we 7.8 billion have a huge footprint. We are, we are drawing the resources of the rest of the natural world towards us. We're drawing animals and trees, timber, um, fossil fuels, um, minerals such as coal tan necessary in computers and cell phones, drawing those toward us. And as we do that, we draw the viruses of the natural world toward us too. All of the, um, the species of wild animal, the great diversity of wild animals that live in our diverse ecosystems, they all carry viruses. They carry unique viruses and, and unimaginable diversity of viruses. So by doing all this, succeeding so well and pulling resources toward us so hungrily, we are bringing upon ourselves these viral infections. Uh, and we, are, we live at great concentration in our cities and we travel very efficiently and quickly in our airplanes. And so once a virus is in it, is in us and can replicate and can transmit human to human, then it can go everywhere and achieve that great Darwinian success we were just talking about. So success for a virus doesn't necessarily mean misery and death for humans, but it frequently does. And in this case, it does. When, when you were just telling us about um, the, your, your mega transect expedition with Michael Fay there, you, you mentioned conscientiously avoiding eating uh, local bush meat. Um, is the fact that these spillover events exist um, evidence for supporting humans trying to move away from meat in their diet? Well, would that have a significant um, effect on reducing spillover events, do you think? Well, it's a very complex question, David, but candidly, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not a vegetarian myself, but the more I study this, the more I know I need to move more and more toward vegetarianism. I'm not telling anyone else what to do, um, at least directly. <laughs> um, but yes, um, consuming all those resources in all those different ways uh, causes this problem. And one way in which we're consuming those resources is the most direct and literal way. We are eating animals. We are eating wild animals, some of us, and we are eating domesticated animals, some of us. And domesticated animals too have a footprint. And they are in some cases an intermediary for viruses that come out of wild animals. Most of our influenzas, for instance, come into humans from wild aquatic birds, but not directly, indirectly by infecting domestic poultry. Um, and that's why uh, I think it's fair to say that's why most of the new influenzas come from Southeast Asia where you live, because it's much more common in Southeast Asia for people to live, at least in villages, for people to live in close proximity with their domestic poultry, their chickens and their ducks. And that represents a risk factor for the influenzas. So all of this, factory farming of pigs, factory farming of, of, of beef, um, all of these things are part of this, yes. Are they the only thing? No. So if a person is vegetarian and has four children, I would say, well, your footprint is probably larger than mine if I have no children and I eat some meat. So all, and, and then travel, I travel a lot, at least I used to travel a lot. Um, I'm not traveling now, uh, but I, in an average year, I travel a lot. That's a responsibility for a large carbon footprint for me. So uh, eating meat is definitely part of it. And, and if all of us move toward eating less meat, that will help. But I think none of us should feel righteous unless we examine all of these different aspects of our footprint. In your book, Spillover, you, you looked at several different examples of uh, zoonotic diseases. Before the outbreak this year of uh, COVID-19, which one did you think was probably the next pandemic? Yes, well, um, I've, frankly, a coronavirus. 
coming out of China. Um, uh, and near the end of my book, as you know, I, I, I talk about having asked a number of these disease scientists that I spent time with, um, sometimes in the field, sometimes in their offices, uh, many times in the field. And I, I sort of informally polled them over a period of time. If there's a next big one, a, a next big pandemic, what does it look like? What's the cause? What's the shape? What's the scenario? And what they essentially told me, um, if you added up the different versions that they gave me and put it into one scenario, the most probable scenario was, yes, there will be a pandemic that will cause a lot of misery and death to humans. It'll be caused by a virus. The virus will be a new virus, freshly spilled over into humans from a wild animal. What kind of a wild animal? Well, possibly a primate because they're closely related to us, or possibly a bat because they carry a great diversity of dangerous viruses. Where might that happen? Well, somewhere where humans come into disruptive contact with wild animals. For instance, in an area where animals are captured live for food and taken to market, taken to, for instance, a wet market. Where, oh well, for instance, in China. And there it was. And that's what I heard from them as the most probable scenario. And that's what I offered in my book in 2012 as the most probable scenario. Which is one of the reasons why my phone won't, won't well, I should say, shouldn't say my phone. It's one of the reasons why my email won't stop going boing now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, people, people say, well, uh, what does it feel like to be prescient? Um, and first of all, I have two answers to that. First answer is, I, I wasn't prescient, but the scientists that I talked to saw this coming, and I reported what they said. And my second answer is, if I'm prescient, in this case, I'd rather be wrong. Why have governments been so unprepared to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak, do you think, David? David, would you please answer that question for me? Because I'm still puzzled. <laughs> I'm still amazed. That's the one thing about this whole outbreak, the whole last three months, four months, that has surprised me most is that the United States of America was caught with its pants down. The United Kingdom was caught with its pants down. Some countries responded well to this and controlled it early on. They're still fighting. They're still trying to deal with second waves. Countries like, I think Cambodia was quite good. I don't know the details, but Singapore was good. The Republic of Korea was good. Germany was good. Italy was punished early on. I don't think it's because Italy was so bad. I think Italy was unlucky. The United States was unlucky and also bad. Um, shamefully, horrifyingly, shockingly um, disorganized and unprepared. And we had leadership that um, was, you know, truculent and isolationist and clueless and confused uh, and, and we're suffering the results. There, there, there seems to be a lot of criticism, um, particularly about a global um, organizations who, whose job it is, uh, amongst many others, to, to monitor and hopefully prevent um, global events of pandemics, such as the WHO and, and the various CDCs um, in, in, Amer in America, China, and elsewhere. Do, do you think this criticism is valid, or, or do, you, do you think it, it, it's overdone somewhat? Well, I think it depends on which, which organization you're talking about. Um, the, in America, our CDC certainly has something important to answer for because they did such a, a bad job in, um, in commissioning and acquiring diagnostic kits, diagnostic test kits. Um, the World Health Organization is always criticized um, and probably deserves a fair bit of criticism. It is, after all, a branch of the United Nations. It is um, an organization that has, that, um, has um, a great deal of politics pushing on it from all directions. Uh, it's not the ideal organization, and it never can be because it's it's a, you know it's the it's it's the creature of the United Nations. Um, it's the best we have to deal with this sort of thing at the international level. Um, China um, uh, public officials in in Hubei province certainly deserve some criticism for the fact that they 
apparently concealed the fact of human-to-human tr- -human transmission during a crucial week or two in the month of December. Um, but in some ways, China's response has been extremely efficient, um, uh, draconian, but efficient. Uh, draconian responses don't work so well in democracies like the UK or um, the US or Italy. Um, Singapore is a different story. Singapore is a very special sort of place and um, a very, very civilized place, but a place where there is a great deal of public compliance with government regulations and government orders, and that's helped them. Um, it's not like the Wild West here where, where I live. Um, so yes, there's criticism. There's enough criticism to go around um, to many different organizations. Um, I think the criticism uh, is less important than figuring out what we can do better as soon as possible and also better the next time because there will be another one of these. It will be, if not a pandemic, there will be a pandemic threat. And if we're prepared next time, maybe we can control it so that it's an epidemic in one country rather than a pandemic around the world. David, you've, you've previously said that every emerging disease starts with a mystery story. Um, do you think there is much mystery about the origins of the COVID-19 outbreak or is this a clear cut case of, of spillover in, in your no, that's mind? A good, that's a good question, David, and thank you for asking it. I did say that about the, the cases that I followed in spillover. This is also a great mystery in terms of the origins. We know that this, is, this virus has, has its ultimate origins in, um, uh, in, a, in a bat, that bats are the reservoir host for those viruses that, that from which this virus is evolutionarily descended. But how did it get to be this particular virus rather than the viruses that are known, the coronaviruses that are known in other, um, uh, in bats? some of which are 96% similar to this mm -hmm. virus. But that 4% difference is a very important difference. Where did it come from? Did this virus um, pass through um, pangolins, for instance? Um, these wonderful creatures that I'm, I'm writing about now, a magazine's story on pangolins, pangolin conservation and pangolin as pangolins as possible intermediary hosts. Uh, some people say yes, some people say no. They're very smart scientists looking at the genomes, comparing the genomes to try and figure out uh, whether uh, how this virus evolved for what looks like 40 years or so, um, separate from its closest known relatives uh, among the coronaviruses that reside in bats. Where did it spend those 40 some years? And then sometime last November, perhaps, or October, how did it spill over from that animal, one individual animal, into one individual human to begin this whole pandemic? We don't know the answers, uh, but I, I, I hope that we can learn more, and I'm certainly going to watch that, um, that mystery story carefully and hope that uh, I can help um, uh, help communicate it to the general public when more is known. Do you think one reasonable response to, to this current uh, outbreak um, is to ask China and, and other countries to close down their wet markets? Are our wet markets simply uh, too dangerous as potential places of transmission to allow them to continue? You know, wet market is a term that's used about these kinds of fresh markets in China. Um, and I, I mentioned, I'm talking about this with a, with a Chinese friend, a young Chinese journalist friend of mine, Wu Fai Yu, uh, a week or so ago. And he said, um, wet markets, well, that's where my father took me when I was young to buy vegetables. Um, so a wet market is a, uh, is a cornucopia of um, food products, ranging from fresh vegetables um, through um, and fruits, um, through seafood, live and dead, um, domestic poultry, domestic meats, live domestic animals, pigs, and ranging all the way to wild animals captured live from the wild 
and brought in in cages, wild birds of all sorts, wild reptiles and amphibians of all sorts, wild mammals, porcupines, pangolins in some cases, uh, bats in some cases. Um, so that's the, that's the ultimate wet market. When I visited um, markets in China, it was in the period not long after the first SARS event and the, the trade in wild animals had been suppressed and it had gone underground, according to what I heard, that, that uh, porcupines and pangolins and, and other creatures from the wild were still being traded, but in the back door of restaurants and, and at night and off of trucks and things like that, not in the open markets. Um, so should international pressure be brought to bear on China to close these wet markets? Well, I think the answer is um, we, we don't want to stop people from selling fresh vegetables. Um, we're not prepared to stop people from selling seafood to make it illegal or domestic animals. The crucial thing in wet markets is wild animals, not bred in captivity as some are, but wild animals captured from the wild, brought live to these markets where they can, where they have to defecate, they have to urinate, they, you know, they, they shed virus and virus that can get into other animals. That's the dangerous point. That's the interface with these viruses. So, um, so, so that's what um, that's what China uh, hopefully will do, and they have, to have taken steps already in that direction. They have moved in that direction to to regulate, outlaw, ban um, the capture of wild animals for uh, for sale as food in wet markets. That should hey. help. David, um, in in the 1990s, you you wrote a book called The Song of the Dodo um, about the, the the extinction of the dodo and and island uh, bio biogeographies. Um, many people nowadays say that we're living through a mass extinction event and and refer to our age as the the Anthropocene because you know, humans are so in control or or in the process of overwhelming our environment. Um, does this also contribute to, to spillover events? And, and do, you, do you agree that we are living through a mass extinction of animals at the moment? I'll take the two questions in reverse order. Yes, I agree. And that's what I was saying in the Song of the Dodo. Uh, it was published back in 1996. I started writing it in about 1987. Yes, it's about, um, the subtitle is, um, uh, island biogeography in an age of extinctions. And the premise of it is, yes, we are living, we are causing the sixth great mass extinction on planet Earth. The other five have been caused by asteroids, uh, radical climate change, other naturally occurring global catastrophes. And the sixth is caused by the things that I've been discussing, we've been discussing, um, human dominance of the planet, human hunger for, for resources. So yes, we are causing the sixth great mass extinction and it's a huge catastrophe. Um, is that one of the causes of spillover and pandemic disease? Um, in some cases they are related as cause and effect, yes. But I think of the situation we're in as, um, the situation where we have three huge problems on planet Earth. And those three huge problems are um, the threat of pandemic disease, um, climate change, and the loss of biological diversity. And, and they run like three great rivers parallel to one another, but they have the same ultimate cause. The three great rivers are, are running off from a single snowfield on a single mountain, and we humans are melting that snowfield. Um, and the way we're doing it is with what I've discussed, you know, 7.8 billion of us now um, with a voracious appetite for resources from the rest of the natural world. And I'd point out that 7.8 billion is almost four times the human population back at the time of the 1918 influenza. In a hundred years, we have quadrupled our, our population and certainly more than quadrupled our consumption. And so uh, no wonder um, species are going extinct. No wonder we have climate change. No wonder we have pandemic disease threats. 
because we are crazily abundant and voracious, um, chewing up this planet from one side to another. I'm not a misanthrope, I should add, David. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, there are wonderful things about humans. We're capable, we're capable of wonderful things. You know, we're capable of mo producing a Mozart and a Beethoven. We're capable of iambic pentameter and, um, uh, and, and um, organized baseball and grandmaster chess. Uh, but we are also causing these huge impacts. Mo moving on to your most recent book, David, The Tangled Tree, um, especially given all what's happening now and, and, and the fact that the word virus is 99.9% is .9 negative for most people at the moment. I, I was fascinated by how The Tangled Tree actually portrays uh, one very important and, and quite perhaps positive role of viruses um, in terms of horizontal gene transfer that you write about. That's right, that's right. Uh, horizontal gene transfer is a very counterintuitive phenomenon. I hadn't even heard about it until 2013 and that and it launched me into this book, The Tangled Tree. Horizontal gene transfer is the movement of genetic material sideways from one species to another, from one lineage to another, from one kingdom of life into another. It's supposed to be impossible, according to um, classic uh, neo-Darwinian theory and um, and uh, and what's called the uh, the Weismann barrier, um, at least among complex creatures. Um, information is not supposed to be able to move into genomes coming in sideways, but it turns out that it does. How does that happen? Well, the simplest explanation, it's a complex set of processes, but the simplest way to talk about it is infective heredity. Genome material, DNA, can be brought into lineages by infection, can be brought in by infection um, by a virus or a bacterium that manages to drop sections of DNA in the cells of the the host creature that it infects. And if it drops the DNA in the reproductive cells, the germ, the uh, sperm cells, the egg cells, the stem cells that create sperm cells and egg cells, then it can become heritable. And this has happened at a number of times in the history of life, which is why my book is titled The Tangled Tree. It means that the branches of the tree of life have not just diverged, but they have, some of them have flowed into one another entangled with one another, which is something you don't see in trees in the wild. But in, as the representation of the history of life, the tree has to be tangled in that way with some limbs going straight into others, delivering DNA sideways from one lineage to another. Um, and the, the most vivid case of this, which I described near the end of the book, is the fact that um, the human genome contains on average about 8% DNA from retrovirus infection. Retroviruses are a group of viruses that include HIV. Um, they, they're called retro because they move backwards and they insert their genomes into the genomes of the cells that they infect. And um, that becomes a program in the cell, usually to create more viruses at a certain point. But sometimes that viral DNA goes into the cells of a host creature and it stays there quietly and it might even evolve over time to have a function for the host creature. If it goes into the to the reproductive cells and becomes heritable then it becomes part of the lineage of that set of animals or those mammals or those primates. The human genome contains 8% viral DNA from this process, including one gene that was originally a viral gene that made a viral envelope, a package, a container, a sort of a capsule around a virus. And now it creates a different kind of membrane or envelope, the membrane that goes between the fetus and the placenta during human pregnancy. And without that membrane, Human pregnancy is impossible. The membrane has a very fancy name, syncytiotrophoblast. 
Um, it's an aggregation of cells that, um, uh, that, that sort of shed their boundaries and became, become sort of a, a glutinous membrane. But it's important because it transmits nutrients from the mother into the fetus. It carries waste products from the fetus back out to the mother so that she can excrete them. Without this membrane, human pregnancy is impossible. Again, where does it come from? From a viral infection that became part of the human genome. Do you think um, in the future there, there will be any medical applications of horizontal gene transfer for, for humans? Well, uh, yes, um, is the simple answer to that, but my mind reels to try and um, sketch what, what they may be. People are working on that. Um, there is a lot of, essentially, w when we talk about um, genetic engineering, um, the idea of putting um, genes into another organism in order to, for instance, um, take, take a particular gene that creates um, insulin and you put it into, splice it into a bacterium and then you breed that bacterium up in big cauldrons and the bacteria produce insulin. That's horizontal gene transfer performed by humans. So we have been mimicking this as we have developed our genet, quote, you know, genetic engineering or genetically modified organism, organisms. That is a form of horizontal gene transfer um, performed artificially by humans. The real surprise is that um, that has been controversial. Some people say, well, we shouldn't genetically modify organisms. We shouldn't move you know, a gene from a jellyfish into a tomato in order to achieve something. Um, but it turns out that nature has been doing that all along. Nature has been doing that for 4 billion years. So the clean moral line that seemed to have been drawn between genetically modified organisms and natural organisms disappears when you understand that, gen that horizontal gene transfer is one of the most ancient processes in evolution. And uh, as, as you uh, refer to in the tangled tree, um, it's very much like well, what Lynn uh, Margulis said about mosaic creatures almost as though we're some sort of uh, haphazard put together of many different uh, genes that have transferred across from different species. That's right, that's right. Lynn, a wonderful, wonderful, um, radical, visionary, creative, um, provocative American scientist. Lynn Margulis is the way I pronounce her name, I think, and, and that's why she pronounced it. But yeah, Lynn Margulis, and she's a character in Tangled Tree. She is, um, she is one of my favorite characters. I knew her a little bit at the end of her life. She was, she was a, a wonderful, bossy, brilliant, generous, motherly scientist. Um, and, um, and she popularized, no, that's the wrong word. She revived a, a very controversial, neglected idea called endosymbiosis. And that idea was that certain crucial organelles inside the cells of complex creatures such as us um, had been acquired essentially by um, in the distant past two billion years ago one cell gobbling another but not digesting it or one cell infecting another but not being digested so that there, there arose a symbiosis an endosymbiosis between the cell on the inside and the cell that contained it and, um, and she argued this for years, and people said, you're crazy. She argued, for instance, that the mitochondria in our bodies, mitochondria is an organ, organelle inside each of our cells that packages energy so that we can be complex creatures with complex processes going on. Those mitochondria are crucial in all of our cells. Lynn said, those mitochondria are captured bacteria. They are descended from a bacterium that got encased, embodied, engulfed in another cell two billion years ago and evolved to become an internal organ um, through this process of endosymbiosis. And people said, you're crazy, Lynn. Um, but then genome sequencing, she was, she was a microscopist, an old classic 
microbiologists who looked at things through microscopes and said, this looks like that, therefore conclusion. And, and she argued this with that sort of evidence and people didn't believe her. And then um, in the wake of some work by my other central character in the book, Carl Woese, a microbiologist in Illinois, um, people began sequencing genomes and comparing them, comparing the genomes of one organism to another. And somebody said, well, let's compare the genome of a mitochondrion with the creature that it lives within. And by doing that, mitochondria also have genomes. So they sequenced the genome and they said, oh my God, it is a bacterium. It's descended from a bacterium. A form, we can even identify the kind of, of bacteria cyanobacteria, no, alpha proteobacteria, the alpha proteobacteria. So our mitochondria are descended from the alpha proteobacteria. That was Lynn Margulis's um, great contribution confirmed with the methodology that Carl Woese had pioneered. These are, the, these are the crazy creatures, as you know, running around in this, in this book of mine, The Tangled Tree. It's a story about the idea of the history of life, the, the book is, and as it's been challenged by these discoveries from genome sequencing and the work of scientists like Carl Woese and Lynn Margulis and Ford Doolittle and a number of others. David, do you, do you have any plans for your next uh, published work at the moment, your next book? My next book, yes, David. I, I was working on a book about cancer and evolution, cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. And I was in Tasmania in February researching that book um, by spending time with some scientists studying uh, an extraordinary, peculiar, contagious cancer in the Tasmanian devil. It's passing, genuinely contagious, passing from one Tasmanian devil to another. And then while I was there, COVID-19 exploded. And I got back to Montana just in time before things closed down. And I've been here ever since. And my publisher has asked me, would you please push that book to the back of your desk and give us a book about COVID-19? Um, now, I'm, usually I like to write books about things that no one else is paying attention to at the time. Obviously, everyone is paying attention to this and there will be, a, who knows, 100 books, 200 books about COVID-19, but Simon and Schuster, bless their hearts, have said they would like theirs to be by me. So I, I am now starting research on it, no, a continuing research on, on a book about COVID-19 with particular interest in, in the, the science and the origins of, of this virus. Well, I, I certainly look forward to, to reading that book uh, when, when it does come out, David. Thank you, thank you so much for answering my questions today and thank you for, for making time uh, to do so. You're very welcome. It's been, a, it, for me, a very enjoyable and easy conversation, David. Um, nice to talk with you about this, and I appreciate your interest. Thanks for watching the latest episode in Bibliophene.com's video series, Interview with the Author. David's two books, Spillover and The Tangled Tree, are available now, and there's a link below in the video description if you'd like to know more. There's also a link to David's personal website for you to stay up to date with his latest work and media appearances. If you enjoyed our video today, please be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and remember to click the bell icon to be sure to receive the latest updates and further author interviews from bibliophene.com. Alternatively, you can check out our website, which is linked below, as well as our presence on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. That's all for this time. See you on the next edition of Interview with the Author.